I'm making this video because I've been asked multiple times, what are my favorite monsters from my 5e book, Esper's Emporium of Esoterica? And this is very difficult for me to answer because, well, for one, there's a lot of creatures in here. There's like over 170 monsters and NPCs, and also because they're all special to me in some kind of way. But I think some of them really do have a even more special place in my heart, in my memory. So I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try to give this a shot and narrow it down to the 10 that are my favorite. I'll also talk about some of the Easter eggs that are sprinkled all throughout this book. Not all of them, because I like to leave mysteries and riddles out there. And by the way, there are still hardcover versions of this book available for purchase if you're interested. There's a link down in the video description. And of course, there's the uh, the PDF version as well. It's a really nice PDF. And um, it's a really big book that honestly, it probably should have been two different books. Uh, it's for players and GMs. It's got content on both sides, sort of like Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, Monster Manual, all put into one. So uh, I poured my heart and soul into this book and spent a ton of time crafting it. There were some other people involved that helped with some really good illustrations and some editing. Anyhow, you can find the links for that down below. Let's proceed. Starting things off at number 10, I'm going to have to go with the Spell Warped Owlbear. There's a running joke on my channel that I hate on owl bears. Um, it is somewhat of a joke, but it is also somewhat sincere. See, the owl bear in and of itself, I don't really have a problem with. I guess depending upon how it's depicted in the uh, illustration, it can look kind of goofy and silly, but it can also look cool too. Really what I have an issue with is the design. It's just such a plain, boring monster mechanically speaking, and the lore just doesn't really have much going on. I think it's just a bunch of missed opportunities. So I took it upon myself to make a couple owl bears for this book. One of them is the Spell Warped Owl Bear. The lore actually states that the first owl bears were created by a wizard, by one Egar Zygag, and uh, he amalgamated through arcane experimentation the apex predators of owl and bear. And the result is that there is unstable wild magic suffusing the owlbear. It has a shattering screech that deals thunder damage in a cone and can also shatter potions and potentially other glass items that the characters are carrying. The first time that it takes damage each round, there is an eldritch reaction. It's this burst of unstable arcane energy, kind of like a wild magic surge. The DM rolls a d8 and that can produce a variety of different strange and unique effects from one to eight. They range from harmful to the owlbear all the way to most harmful to the characters. So they are exploding eyes, scattering burst of feathers, violent spasms, a mad rage, extending limbs, awful gas. Um, the owlbear can cough up an elemental pellet or it will erupt into that screech, that shattering screech that I just described. Now oh, also it has wings, so it can fly. At number nine, I'm gonna go with the Keeper of Lost Things. This one just has a lot of nostalgia and you know, she really embodies that sense of all the different things you've lost throughout your life, maybe childhood toys or personal objects and trinkets that had sentimental value. Um, I think it could also be losing non-physical things as well. She definitely hits that like longing, yearning, homesickness, um, you know, the, the pining for better times or for older, more innocent times. She's a fey creature and she has some different abilities that I thought were pretty cool and unique. She does have some spells that fit her theme, like locate object or knock, as she does like to sneak into places and find and I guess in a way steal things. She carries this big pack of items with her and within the pack, there are some different creatures that she can summon out as allies. There is a little fork knight. There is a candelabra that can do like a little fire bolt. There's an old scrolls. That's actually an Easter egg for Elder Scrolls. And even one of its abilities is the Winds of Morrow, 
which harkens to Morrowind, which is probably my favorite video game of all time. And a ringworm, no, not the like parasite thing, but literally a little worm made of rings put together. She could also swap out any of those little allies of hers with the Tatterdemelion, which is a little minor CR 1 8th patchwork sackcloth ragdoll scarecrow type construct, sort of like what a mage might learn first when learning how to create constructs. And once per day, she can become invisible and she sends out this wave of uh, magical effects that can potentially make people lose all their memories of her from within the past hour. And then she will, you know, sneak away forgotten and unseen. Also a tidbit from the lore of this creature, there is one specific named Keeper of Lost Things known as Mother Saudity. She's sort of a nursery rhyme fairy tale type creature that, you know, is known as this eerie thief like thing, but also in a way has a sort of maternal quality to her. That name Mother Saudity actually comes from uh, a Portuguese word, saudade, as they would say in Brazil or in Portugal, they'd say saudade. And it's a word that essentially means like longing for something, deeply missing something or someone. And a lot of times it could be for things, you know, that you experienced or you shared in the past. Um, there's not exactly a direct English translation for this word, but probably longing or homesickness is the best translation for it. But um, I thought saudity would be like this literal translation of the word saudade. And um, it's such a special word in the Brazilian and the Portuguese culture. So I thought it would be nice to to work that into her lore. In eighth place, I'm going to go with the astral dragon. It was hard to pick between this one and the orb dragon. These are the two dragons in the book. Uh, the orb dragon is a chaotic neutral dragon, has a lot of magical and spell based abilities. It's bonded to this magical orb, has connections to the ethereal plane, and they dwell on islands. The astral dragon has obviously connections to the astral plane, and they dwell atop the highest mountain peaks in the world, and they go on these voyages through astral crossings into the astral plane. Some people call it the astral sea. Um, they're also pretty magical. They're lawful neutral. Um, they have really powerful tail attacks. I, I guess I'm kind of putting both of these dragons in here together, um, but maybe the astral dragon will be more of the focus. I like how the artwork turned out on this one. I did the artwork on this creature and it's just cool seeing this unique kind of dragon that's not really a chromatic or metallic dragon, has a connection with one of the gods in my world. His name is Illus the Lantern. And if you look at the full page illustration for the astral dragon, you'll actually see they're the constellation of the lantern. That's the form that that god takes in the present day. For a breath weapon, the astral dragon can fittingly breathe out a cone of radiant damage. It can also breathe out a cone of blinding light. And instead of a dragon's typical frightful presence, the astral dragon has this luminous form where it beams out luminous iridescence that lights up a really big radius and also dispels magical darkness. It also has some pretty cool legendary actions and layer effects, and I really enjoyed making this dragon and the orb dragon. I think they fill some really neat niches and neat roles that we haven't really seen explored much with the typical dragons. At number seven, I'm going to have to go with Black Tongue. He's in the named NPC section of the Bestiary. This character is very special and has a lot of history with me, with my channel. Technically, he does not come from Ikoros. He comes from my previous world. Novara, which I no longer, I have not done D&D in that world for many years now. I only use it for like long form writing, like fantasy writing, but I just had to put him in here. If you go way back into the older videos of my channel, around the beginning of fifth edition, I did this series of videos that I've loosely titled the Novara series. And the first episode of the first video in that series is called the Tomb of Black Tongue. So in that video, he's actually a historical character. So what you're seeing in the book here is the stat block of a character who used to exist. His name was Magros Velosa. He was this eldest son of a noble house, a battle captain, battle leader, a pretty severe fellow, but also a masterful warrior. And he eventually came into possession of this grimoire, this dark tome of curses. And he studied it obsessively and learned a number of these curses, which he wielded in battle. But the more that he used it, the more that it stained his tongue black. And he himself 
became afflicted with a vile curse because of this connection. It eventually brought about his demise. So in his stat block, he's this sort of dark warrior wearing plate armor, and he also has these curses that he can inflict upon his enemies. Things like a curse of facelessness, or vermin spewing out of your mouth whenever you try to talk, or hellish howling, or this like warping malediction. He also has a vile spittle. His tongue became this elongated, blackened thing, and he can spit out acid. Correction, necrotic damage. There's just so much nostalgia and memories for me related to Black Tongue and then all those adventure videos that I did and they start off with the descendant of Magros Velosa, Crusos Velosa, who's searching for the long lost tomb of Black Tongue and that grimoire of curses and it leads to a number of other connected adventures in that series, all done in that narrated adventure style that I'm fond of doing. It also brings back a lot of pleasant memories and feelings for me about the early days of 5th edition and I just had some really good times back then, some really creative adventures, the edition was fresh and so it's that sense of wonderment and newness and it was still kind of connected to D&D in the classic sense of the game. Things have changed a lot now and I've talked about that in other videos, I'm not really getting into that here though. In 6th place we have the Host of Angels. Again, a very special creature to me. This one actually comes from a pretty personal and spiritual type experience that I had. Um, it was a moment in which I was being very plagued by both, let's say, bouts of anxiety and very negative, dark, dreadful thoughts. So compulsive or intrusive uh, thoughts, you know, bad, nasty things, and other just kind of nightmarish thoughts that are hard to even describe. And there was this one day, really this one night, that things were particularly bad and I hadn't felt well either, like I was feeling physically ill. But I I, I lay down here in, in my office and went through some of the, let's say, meditations and prayers and visualizations that that I'll usually go through, not trying to be controlling over the thoughts, but rather letting them flow on their own and to show you what it is that you're supposed to see. So it was a pretty awful nightmarish image that came into my mind of a, a demon, I guess I would say, some kind of horrific monstrosity. It was very grotesque. It was like something out of a supernatural demonic horror movie meets body horror movie a horrible thing and i it you know was harming me and devouring me and corrupting me and i just let this awful image play out and so that played out it kind of like went through this whole nightmare sequence and it was it was pretty bad but i faced it and so i you know i felt a, a little bit more courageous and then i used this this other technique related technique that i learned where you face the nightmarish thing or the, the, the terrible thoughts in your mind and you envision yourself overcoming them in some sort of way or you envision them being overcome in some sort of way. And again, I was doing this in more of a meditative way. I was letting it flow as opposed to me uh, actively controlling anything. And I just you know put my trust in knowing that there was some greater force of light that would overcome this darkness within. And in this vision that I had, this, this image in my mind, this, let's say, company of warriors of light on radiant wings descended down and they, they vanquished this awful demon. And they, they lifted me up in their midst into the air amidst their, their, their radiance and their their luminous bodies, these angelic forms. There was a golden light that came from their hands and it it healed me. And it it brought, um, I don't think comfort is quite the right word, and, and invigoration, it was like a life, right? They, they brought this, this, this liveliness, this infusion of this kind of grace, um, and it was beaming, like channeling through them. And it was this beautiful, what was an awful nightmarish moment transformed into this, this beautiful moment. So out of that inspiration came the idea for this host of angels. It also was related to my development of this mechanic for monsters in 5e where they are a horde monster. 
not a swarm of tiny little things like a swarm of, of, of bugs, but you know, multiple medium-sized creatures in like a huge or a gargantuan area that function together as, as one. So they have weapons of light, both arrows and blades, and they have some a few different spells and healing capabilities. They fly and they act as one unit, and they can show up as a, a force of goodness and light and hope when there is only darkness and despair otherwise. There's also in the flavor text a, a bit from an old, old hymn called Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence. Yeah, how's that for a song title? It uses very poetic, classic type language, and it's a beautiful hymn. If you go and check it out, it has a beautiful, you know, deeply stirring melody to it. In fifth place is the Dobo Dame. This is a monster that I've talked about in one or two different live streams, and um, it's worth repeating. If, if you haven't heard about it yet, here you go. So there were a number of different artists that worked, you know, creating illustrations for this book. I really enjoyed the process of working with the artists, and I'm, I've been really enjoying the process of working with artists for my upcoming book, Monstrous Heroes. It's I love this process of art directing, of getting to know the artists, of just this, the whole creative side of it. So one of the artists um, that was working on the Emporium was uh, Isla Husseinovic, and she has a very surreal and even nightmarish style to a lot of her art pieces. Every artist is a bit different, and, and I got to really learn that throughout that process. And one thing I noticed with Isla is that the more I gave very specific guidelines for an art piece, um, the more she, she struggled or the more her creativity went a bit dry, but the more creative freedom she had, um, the more she would produce something that was uh, deeper and, and the quality was better. So I said, for your last, this was your last piece. I said, for this last piece, I don't have any monster in mind. I want you to just tap into whatever inspiration is currently moving you the most. Whatever it is at this moment, whatever inspiration is speaking to you, just channel into that or let it channel through you rather and just go with it as far as you can take it and create. Just create whatever comes out and then based upon what you've created visually, then I'm going to go and it's going to speak to me and I will create the idea for the monster and the lore and the stats and all that. And so she created this thing, which turned out to be the Dobo Dame. It's sort of the inverse of a fallen angel. It actually was a demon and it came to this somehow a moment of self-awareness or an awareness or an empathy even of all the horrific, wrongful, you know, sins against reality that it has committed, all the harm and all the suffering that it has wreaked upon other people and innocent people. And in this moment, its, its soul went through a sort of metamorphosis or entered a sort of metamorphosis state and it rebelled against hell or rebelled against the abyss, however you want to describe that in the, um, in the cosmology. And it, it either was able to escape from hell or was ejected from hell. And it wanders the like, you know, forlorn wastes of the world. It goes like way out into the, the desert wastes, removed from civilization, wandering, and it's so shocked and revolted and, and bothered and, and anguished by the memories of all the awful things that it did that it actually claws out its own brain. So its head is, the, is a hollow head. It just has some strands and wisps and just kind of looks like this empty seed pod sort of thing. Uh, it has one wing. It carries this staff that is not really a worked staff at all. It's just this crude branch from a tree, but it clutches onto it because it's the symbol of like, I found this one true living good thing out here in the wastes and, and, and it wants to hold on to it. And it basically has this quest in which it has to find a way to atone and reconcile for its past evils in order to complete its metamorphosis and become a celestial and be admitted into you know the celestial domains of heaven. If it succeeds in its task, at the end of that quest, the that staff plants into the ground and becomes this healthy, fruitful, bountiful tree. It bears this nutritious, good fruit. And if it fails in its quest, the tree again plants, but it's this gnarled, 
thorny, poisonous plant with bad fruit. And in that case, the Dobo Dame does not ascend to a celestial and it just becomes essentially a ghost like this tormented wandering spirit. It has some different abilities, some different magical abilities and a few like combat abilities. Um, though in a way it's more of a story and role playing type monster. And I really want to do an adventure where the characters meet one of these things during an expedition or, an, or a crossing through a desert or a wasteland area. For number four, I'm choosing the Mithril Emperor, also known as the Dragon Emperor. Anji Hushi was his original name. There is a ton of lore for this NPC, and there's a ton of backstory and things that just I could not fit in here because he is a character from an actual campaign that I ran, a fifth edition campaign that I ran over two and a half years, I want to say. And actually, technically, it's like two campaigns in one, the first part and the second part. And Anji is the one character that links throughout the entire thing. And he, you know, has low level, humble beginnings. It has a lot to do with the lore of the world of Ikoros. And he becomes a part of this adventuring party called Phantasma Gentia. And they have all kinds of wild exploits, get into a lot of trouble. And like I said, the campaign shifts and he really has to form a party that dedicates themselves to fighting back against the infernal forces that are seeking to conquer and dominate the known world. The Mithril Emperor is actually the highest CR monster or NPC in the book. He's at CR 24. He's also related to some other NPCs such as the Labyrinth Lord and the True Silver Justiciar. He wields the Fang of the Dragon God. This is actually one of the Fangs of the Mithril Dragon, the God Mitra Satsil, who gave it to Anji and he wields it as a sword. It's like a powerful artifact sword. He wears the Mithril Mask, which is an item that Anji actually wore all throughout his life. Originally, it was just a plain, simple um, kind of expressionless mask and then eventually was remade and recreated into the Mithril Mask. This legendary item, uh, if he dies, it can revivify him. It has some other defensive and magical effects to it. Also, the dragon god gave to him one of his scales and it hovers around Anji sort of like a um, like a floating shield and it's like a legendary magic item as well. Keep in mind, this is a character that went all the way up to level technically 21. He's part monk, part cleric, part wizard. He was a very multi-class character and he was a character that somehow escaped demise just by the skin of his teeth fatefully on multiple occasions and on other occasions he did die and was revivified or, re or resurrected. It was this undying character that somehow escaped ultimate doom so many times it was just meant to be. So he has a lot of monk like abilities, especially sort of like a shadow monk, but think of like shadow and light, both of those expressed in him. Um, and then cleric wise, he's related more to the majesty domain, which is related to the Mitra Satsil dragon god. And, and that's a cleric domain that's in the Emporium book. And then his wizardly spells are usually more things that are like um, enhancements, uh, haste and whatnot, or controlling others like dominate spells or divination type spells. He also has legendary actions like springing strike where he makes an attack and then moves without provoking opportunity attacks. Light and shadow where he can cast the spell celestial form. It's in the Emporium or darkness or soul wind where he channels his dragon gods breath power, which is like this rending force damage cone. There's so much to this character, kind of hard to sum him up. He's a highly mobile character who has some very powerful, iconic, unique named magic items, who is part warrior and part magic user, arcane, divine and martial all in one, and who has a bunch of lore and an important role, a very important role in the world building of Ikoros as he is the reigning emperor of the Bazagonian Empire. He's neutral in alignment and really believes that every soul must have its own dance with fate, must make your own gambles, try to win your own fortune, try to find your own majesty to arise to. A very peculiar and very interesting character. For number three, I'm going to have to go with the Overseer. This is a creature that I've talked about before. I covered it some in my recent video about redesigning the D&D planes, where I was talking about how I'm redoing my world of Ikoros and getting the planes and the cosmology put together. I actually read through the short story that's in this creature's lore 
in that video. So go check that out if you want to know some more on that deeper end of things. So the ethereal plane in the setting is the barrier between the material and the spiritual planes, all the planes outside the material. The ethereal plane is composed of, maintained by the nature spirits of the world, the primal spirits, the plant and animal and sin and so forth. And that barrier blocks out a lot of the big time interlopers. It prevents demon lords and gods and titans from using the material plane as their conquest, as their battleground, as their prize to be won. It's not perfect, but it definitely does its job and does it very well. The overseers also play a role in this cosmological order of things. They are a group of interconnected, sort of a communal deity, lawful neutral in alignment, and they uphold cosmic law. They also try to keep out interlopers that try to go into places they don't belong, particularly the material plane, and they, they operate and they guard the celestial panopticon, which is a prison, let's call it, a holding place that seals away interloper demons and aberrant lords and maybe even misbegotten gods. So an individual overseer, aka one of the Tassari Dakana, is a very powerful creature, a CR-21 unto itself. It has legendary resistance and magic resistance. It casts spells like a 20th level wizard. It has a 100 foot range psionic pulse that causes the target to have to make a wisdom save. And on failure, it takes a bunch of psychic damage and the overseer moves it to 20 feet away in any direction. As a reaction to anything happening, it can stop time. It can freeze time in a massive area around it and act for a bit. It has legendary actions such as Essence Tamper that removes a creature's resistances and immunities, tap into the arcane where it recovers a first or second level spell slot and then casts a second level or lower spell, or Chrono Mastery where it uses all three legendary actions to recover that stop time ability. So a very powerful, lawfully aligned, magical, communal deity creature that holds a very important role in the greater cosmology of holding things together. One thing I'm attempting to do with this Ikoro setting is to have a sort of congruency, a coherence to it all. It doesn't have to be perfect. It is fantasy. There's going to be bits about it that aren't really logical or rational. Things that are going to be dreamy or mystical or myth-like, and that's fine. I just want it to have a coherence, a sort of consistency to it all. Number two, I'm going to have to go with the Obardan. This is a very dark monster. It also is connected quite a bit to my adventure Blood Lament. I live streamed that adventure um, a while back, a year or two ago. It's described as an adventure of dark secrets and mystical terror. And I think that's a great way to sum up the Obardan, which is one of the major key monsters in that adventure. Again, the lore plays heavily into this creature where it has a backstory to it. It came from two princes of the Fertile Splay region, Obar and Obaya, and they were some really rotten, vile princes. They were then apprehended and punished by the Hierophant, really the high priest. He removed their eyes and invoked a divine curse, and one of the gods transformed them into this horrific, two-headed monstrosity thing. It's a kind of horror giant with these two long-necked heads that look kind of like monstrous weasels. And the weasel heads have no eyes and they weep black tears and they have these long forked tongues that each hold two eyes and it casts these eye rays and can deliver curses to those that strike it. All around, just a really nasty monster. Its, its bites and its claws do quite a bit of damage. It really was a hell of a monster for the party to fight when I ran this adventure. It's a monster that just has so much style. It's really gritty, it's really dark. It's connected to the lore and the world building of this one region of my world. Um, it was submitted to me by Adam Wood, who has been a patron, a friend, a fantastic player in a number of my live stream campaigns and uh, he always comes up with really good ideas before we go it's my number one pick i want to show off a couple of the easter eggs that are in the book i'm not going to show them all off like here if you see the full page illustration that's at the beginning of the class option section what we're actually seeing here are these Stormbringers sailing upon their ship, the Storm's Eye, from the Land of Dreams and Nightmares campaign. It was my first live stream campaign ever. It's a little bit rudimentary, but it was a really fantastic campaign. In the image we see here, none other than Captain Noxaqual, 
Lycar the Storm Sorcerer, Carterock Hawkness the Bard Paladin, Drake Fell the Monk Cleric, and Robin the Arcane Trickster Rogue. Oh, and I can't forget, if we just look over here as well, we see First Mate Kobe the Lion. And the spells, you might notice there's a spell called Esper's Amethyst Obelisk. So many years ago, I got this Amethyst Mini Obelisk. It ended up in my dice bag at one point, and since then I just kept it in there. And then whenever I'm playing D&D or whatever game that involves my dice, I always have my Amethyst Obelisk sitting there. Anytime you've heard me rolling dice on live stream campaigns or adventures, it's always there. You can't see it. It's never picked up on camera, but it's always there. Uh, purple's my favorite color. I don't know. I just like it. There's also the spell Cloak of Nevermore, which is a high powered fifth level invisibility spell where the target not only becomes invisible, but it becomes um, undetectable by other senses. You can't hear it. It doesn't leave behind tracks or footprints. You can't smell it. Um, it can only be perceived really by true sight. Also, divination magic cannot detect the target unless the divination magic is of a higher spell slot level than the spell slot level used to cast Cloak of Nevermore. The material component for Cloak of Nevermore is a raven's feather. A little bit of a nod to Edgar Allan Poe, of course, in his classic The Raven poem. Edgar Allan Poe was my initial inspiration to become a writer. I was a storyteller before then. I'd make up stories and creatures and characters and whatnot and play imaginary games with my little friends when I was really little. But one day, when I was still a pretty young kid, down in this like dark storage, not really a book nook, but there was a bookshelf there, this one shadowy corner of my basement, my dad found this book of Edgar Allan Poe and he read The Raven to me. And my dad doesn't even really like Edgar Allan Poe, but he read that to me and it left such an impression on me. It, it just really hit me. And from that moment, I knew that's what I want. I want to be a writer. And then I started actually writing stories. I think it was second grade because my first short story is in second grade. There's this monster in the Emporium called the Ugbobra. And this is actually a nod and homage to my all time favorite rock band, Smashing Pumpkins. It's got a whole bunch of Smashing Pumpkins lyrics and titles of Smashing Pumpkins albums and songs subtly woven in there. The lore paragraphs begin with Behold the Nightmarish Plant of Wrath and Sadness. That's a nod to Behold the Nightmare of Smashing Pumpkins song. Despite the rage that flows to the Ugbobra. A nod to the lyrics from Bolt with Butterfly Wings, despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a cage. It also bears a never-ending melancholy from the album that that song's on, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. After slaying a target, its bloodlust subsides momentarily and it weeps, knowing that its killer spirit will spread into the deceased body. Coming from their song Disarm, off of the amazing album Siamese Dream, where he says the killer in me is the killer in you. It may even shut its mouths and strike itself as though cursing the demons whose corruption seeped into that original ground. A nod to lyrics from their song Mayonnaise, also off of Siamese Dream. One of his features is called Until the Bitter End, from the lyrics to Soma, also from Siamese Dream, and that allows it when it dies to make one last bite or claw attack or use fling pumpkin one last time. When it hits someone with the pumpkin that it flings, the pumpkin bites it, dealing bludgeoning damage, and then it chooses one additional effect, Disarm or Quiet, again to song titles off of Siamese Dream. Disarm can rip an object out of the target's hand, or Quiet can make the target unable to speak or cast spells with verbal components. And another creature that's in the book, the Sturmfeld. This is actually a nod to the mascot of the major university in my hometown of Wichita, Kansas. The mascot is Wooshock. He's basically this big, tough guy made out of wheat. He's an anthropomorphic shock of wheat. And that's what this Sturmfeld is here. And so the local sports teams here are called the Shockers. And therefore the Sturmfeld can use call lightning to bring down some shocking lightning effects. It also has anger of the storm where it moves up to its speed and a scythe of lightning extends from it momentarily 
where it does this melee attack that deals lightning damage. That calls back to an earlier rendition of the Wushok mascot in which he did have a scythe. Being that he's made out of wheat, he is vulnerable to fire, but if someone burns him with fire, he has a reaction where he can call lightning down upon the target who just burned him. So let's get on to the top slot. I'm going to give number one to the Nykta Sphinx. This is a creature that I love in so many different ways. The Sphinx is one of my favorites, if not my all-time favorite monster. The Owl is one of my favorite animals, one of my very favorites. So this thing is Sphinx and Owl merged together. This also relates to you all because this monster was conceptualized by suggestions that came from comments on a live stream on one of my bard streams where we designed or came up with concepts for monsters together. And unfortunately, I don't remember who it is. I could probably go back and find it, but somebody suggested an owl sphinx and I, I, I latched onto that and then other commenters were putting suggestions in for you know what it could look like and where it could live and what kind of features it might have. So it's very special to me because it represents me connecting with you all. That means a lot to me. The artwork's beautiful, done by the amazing Ashkan Ganbari. Again, there's a lot to this creature, has a bunch of lore, has a bunch of different tidbits put in there. Like I wrote riddles, I've got four different riddles that I created, so a GM could use these riddles and interactions with the Nykta Sphinx. It has layer actions like powerful gusts of wind. It has riddling enigmas where enemies in its layer have to succeed on intelligent saving throws. Otherwise, they can only use at-will spells and at-will features for a minute. Soul phase, where creatures of the Sphinx's choice have to succeed on charisma saving throws. Otherwise, they are teleported up to 30 feet without their equipment. And temple bells, by the way, the Nykta Sphinx dwells in this canopy temple. It builds these temple spaces or sacred spaces in the treetops of these massive trees that have been magically grown, magically enhanced, and the deep resonance of these bells, they toll throughout the layer, and the enemies in the layer have to succeed on wisdom saving throws. Otherwise, they must kneel and close their eyes, treated as though prone and blind. The typical sphinxes in 5e can cast either wizard spells or cleric spells, depending on the type of sphinx. The Nykta Sphinx draws from druid spells. Three times per day, it can emit an ethereal call. The first time it calls, it can frighten creatures. The second time, it deals a bunch of psychic damage and frightens the targets. And the third call frightens creatures, and those that are frightened are incapacitated with the fear. And creatures that are frightened have disadvantage on their saves against the Nykta Sphinx, while it has advantage on its attacks against frightened creatures. It has a multi-attack where it makes two claw attacks, and if it has advantage on a claw attack, it deals additional damage. And it has legendary actions. Silent Wings allows it to fly up to half its speed and attempt to hide. Phasing Strike allows it to teleport up to a space it can see and then make a claw attack. Or, for a cost of all three legendary actions, it can cast one of its spells. There's a lot to love about this creature in many different ways. Even its artwork has a bunch of purple hues. Again, purple being my favorite color. I guess that's what you get to do. If you take the time and the effort and the risk of making your own book, you really get to do exactly what you want to do. Of course, the um, the other edge to that sword is that I bit off more than I could chew. I got overly ambitious. The book took way too long to produce. It got delayed for various reasons, such as the plague times and just my own delays. So it, it took a while to get out there. And again, I really should have made it two different books. So kind of shot myself in the foot with that. I guess that's what happens when you make your first project or your first couple projects. You kind of learn through trial and error and learn through your mistakes. I'm kind of facing the same thing with Monstrous Heroes. Really, it should have been two different books. There's just that much content. But hey, I guess more value to you all. And it's going to be um, another excellent book to be able to enjoy for many, many years to come. So thank you, everybody, for watching. I hope you enjoyed this tour of what I think are my top 10 favorites. It was so hard to pick. Uh, thank you all for your support, both in watching the video and for everybody who's been buying the book. And I want to say an extra special thank you to my supporters over on Patreon, especially so the grand level patrons, Adam Wood, Nick Thy Pirate King, Nicholas A, Locke Monroe, and Lucius Tenebri. You guys put wind in my sails and fire in my forge. Until we meet again, my brave companions, keep your Alembics bubbling and your lightning veins charged, 
In your uh, monstrous workshops, you never know what kind of creature will come shambling out of it next. I'll see you guys in the next video. May your adventures be many.